good. This is uh, shorter than the usual one. <laughs> Already? No, I think I think this one is probably probably okay actually. So people like running the edge Yeah. And whacking distance. This one doesn't. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to have uh, Matt Dolan uh, from Cambridge. <coughs> he's one of he's a student of Ben Allenak for the master of Tzof Tzuzi, and he is a proper phenomenologist. He even brought Valia on, his, on the righteous way of doing phenomenology um, with actual data. So uh, today he'll show us um, how to really confront um, <laughs> physics with data, probably using Tzof Tzuzi, I guess. So it's yeah. a pleasure that you <laughs> could come here and welcome. Easy, Nigel. Uh, great. Thank you uh, for inviting me to speak, and uh, thank you for coming to listening to me speak as well, which is even better. So an, an alternative title for this could be Model Selection in Particle Physics, rather than Bayesian Inference. And it sort of is a talk of two halves, and one half is larger than the other. Um, so the, the first half is really on parameter estimation. So you know, we all, well, a lot of us anyway, build models, whether that be sort of beyond standard model physics or, I don't know, flavor physics or cosmology or dark matter or something like this, which we want to confront with data. So I'm just uh, briefly going to say in the first shorter half of the talk a bit about Bayesian statistics and how we can use Bayesian stats to do parameter inference uh, in some model that you like. So since I'm, as has been stated, a, a Susie Fenno person, my examples are all going to be uh, Susie Fenno of some type. So this is essentially an, an MSSM fits talk. So once, once I've talked um, a bit about this parameter estimation, I'll get to sort of the, the main thing, which is really about model selection. So this is inspired by the usual uh, LHC spiel, that it's the era, the dawn, the age, the epoch, the coming of the LHC, et cetera. Um, so this, this has been. You know, these statements have been made essentially for the past five and more years. So it's been time translation invariant that the LHC is, is coming, the LHC is here, blah, blah, blah. So since, you know, there's this time translation invariant statement by Noether's theorem, there has to be a conserved charge. And that conserved charge is the amount of LHC data we have, which is zero. <laughs> so um, so when, when I'm sort of doing these fits to these MSSM models, since we don't have any LHC data, I'm going to be using low energy indirect data. So this is stuff like the dark matter relic density um, and sensitive flavor changing things like beta s gamma and d minus two of the muon and this kind of thing. So that should hopefully give you a, a flavor of what's to come in the talk. Uh, brief summary, so, so Bayesian inference. So let's consider a hypothesis H. So for me, this will be some kind of supersymmetry breaking uh, mediation mechanism in the MSSM later on defined by some parameter space, uh, defined by theta, which describes some data d, so LHC data, or for us, low energy data. So then Bayes' theorem, which I hope you've all learned um, in sort of your first year statistics course, says that the probability of some parameter theta in this parameter space, given this data d, is determined by the probability of the data d given the, the, the point in parameter space theta times the a priori probability of that point in parameter space theta divided by the probability of the data. So that's something of a mouthful. So I'll take this to pieces a bit and then put it back together again. So what, I what is this? Well, this is, this is really what we're interested in. We want to know what is the probability of, of, what's of some point in parameter space, right? How good is this point or region in parameter space fitting some low energy data? How do we find the good, the good fits, uh, the good region of parameter space? So this is really what 
at the end of the day, we want to be calculating. So somehow the inverse of this is the probability of the data given the point in parameter space. And that's called the likelihood function. So generally, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate this likelihood and then come to this posterior, because it's much easier to calculate this than this. So why is that? Well, say I give you some point in you know, um, MSSM parameter space, minimal supergravity parameter space. So it's quite easy for you to then just take the, uh, the RGEs, run them down, and get the spectrum of the MSSM. Then you plug that into a bunch of branching ratios, which have been computed by your phenomenologist friends, and this gives you a, a chi-squared, essentially, the goodness of fit at that point. It's much easier for, for me to say to you, OK, here is a branching ratio. Invert all these complicated um, formulae to get the probability of this one little dot in parameter space. So that's why we go that way. Um, yeah. So then the probability of the point in parameter space, given the model, is called the prior distribution. So the, the priors sort of represent our assumptions and knowledge about the problem, about the inferential problem we're trying to solve, and about the structure of the parameter space before we factor in all the low energy data. So what could, what could this kind of thing be? Well, I think a good example is probably fine tuning. So we all have some kind of intuitive dislike for fine tuning our theories. And this is essentially a, pr a prior which we could put on parameter space. We could consider the low energy data, but we could also then sort of convolute that with a, something which would be inversely proportional to the fine tuning to see what the, the eventual posterior would be for that data. Alternatively, we could just say, well, I really want to s assume some kind of ignorance measure. I want to assume that all points in parameter space are equally likely. And that's a valid thing to do as well. And then once you've done these two analyses, you can compare them to each other. And if you're getting very different results, this is just meaning that your data isn't robust enough to overcome your, your priors, what you thought beforehand. Finally, this guy in the bottom, the probability of the data given the model, or which will be Z later on, is the Bayesian evidence. And for model selection, this is what we're interested in. So I'm just going to go back um, and forget about the evidence for a moment and talk about parameter estimation. So to do parameter estimation, we can just consider two points in parameter space, given oops, this previous Bayes theorem. And we can just divide the posterior for point 1 by the posterior for point 2. And the two uh, evidences, That's sorry? Just a yeah, far away. Yeah, OK, well, this is true. So th there's no like canonical right prior. Yeah. But there, I mean, there's, there's a really large set of stupid priors. This is true. You ask your colleagues. Um, <laughs> no, yeah, you, so. I mean, because otherwise, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of yeah. another level of, uh, you know, of analysis on it. But at the end, yeah. you still don't really. Well, so at, at the end, ultimately, your results in your posterior won't depend on your prior. So if this is happening, then you know it doesn't matter and that the data are strong enough. But if they are depending on the prior, then your data aren't good enough. But if you choose a really stupid prior, then it still might look a bit wacky. all the masses you mean? Yeah. No, no, you don't. Right. And so there's a, there's a, your prior is a prior is, a, is also a cutoff on parameter space, I guess, yeah. Plus it's a model around 10 to the 11 GeV, I think. Yeah. yeah, this is true, yeah. No, I think so, yeah, you can also, priors also include what is the range of parameters that you're actually going to scan in. Because this, this affects, obviously, how good you think the parameter space is. So if you only, say you're fitting to, to something that favors light, Susie, 
I don't know, like you know, th there's a discrepancy like G minus two, and so you decide to scan only over the the mass range 100 GeV to 300 GeV in your supersymmetric particles, right? So then you get a really good fit to G minus two, and you think, oh, fantastic, supersymmetry is amazing. Look, it fits all the entire parameter space is fitting G minus two, success. But if you had scanned over a larger range of parameters, you'd see that there's a whole lot of crappy fit in there as well. So this is also a, a prior problem, yeah. I have, say, a flat distribution in parameter space for my prior. Yeah. Um, if my prior would still change if I kind of use a different parameterization for my um, parameter space. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to show you something to that effect in a moment. Okay. Right. Um, so essentially, to calculate the ratio of posteriors, or the ratio of the goodness of fit of different points in parameter space, we just need to specify the likelihood, so the data to which we're fitting, and how we calculate the goodness of fit to that data, and the, r the, the prior function that we're putting on parameter space. So as I w I've just, I don't know, said a few times, as the data quality increases, the posterior should become dominated by the likelihood and independent of what priors that we're putting on. Um, so I'm going to show you just sort of two plots that in some ways confirm this, and there'll be more plots later on uh, to this effect as well. So this is from a previous, some previous work fitting uh, the large volume scenario, which is just a, an MSSM parameterization derived from type 2b string theory, which only has two uh, free parameters. So somewhat like a, a no-scale supergravity model. So there's a mass scale, which controls all the masses of all the this particles and tan beta. Again, the, again, we calculate the likelihood from the same low energy observables that will be used again and again through this talk. So G minus 2, beta S gamma, dark matter, and many others. And what we find is the posterior is going to be essentially independent of the priors. So the point that Jorg was briefly making was, so if, if I scan over tan beta, I can scan over something that's linear and tan beta. But you might not like tan beta too much. You, you might say, well, you know, this isn't really in the Lagrangian at the high scale. I'd like to really scan over B, because I think B is a really fundamental parameter. So something that's, if a scan that's then flat, or a prior that's flat in tan beta, isn't going to be flat in the B parameter. So if you scan over B, you get something that's quite similar, but not quite the same. So these are just flat in tan beta and flat in B mu. And they're slightly different, because you're not really scanning over the same set of parameters. So that's sort of the end of uh, my parameter estimation spiel. Is there anything? Uh, well, actually, we, we didn't. We, we, we scanned over tan beta, and we just had a Jacobian in there. Yeah. So you, you kind of do the, the same scan, but there's, there's just a Jacobian from the electroweak symmetry breaking. What do you mean, the wrong parameter? So if I had scanned over the Higgs mass or something yeah. like this. Yeah. Wouldn't you get mean inverse distortion? Um, probably, yeah. So you'd say for some Higgs mass, there is some specific value of tan beta to which this corresponds to yeah. for all the other particles. And, and if you start um, sampling flat in You could in sample in flat in MH, in yeah. Into this honey parameter. Mm -hmm. um, the Oh, the distortion you mean between sort of this plot and this plot? Yeah, yeah it will, yeah. It, well, in principle, well, what we're seeing is that this parameter space is quite constrained, so it's no huge difference. But if the parameter space was less constrained, then it would do all kinds of wacky things. This is true, yeah. So basically, can you infer how big your change is by looking at the modestly preferred region and then basically looking how big the Jacobian for going from one variable to the other is? Um, well, the Jacobian tells you something, but also the data are sort of telling you something, right? So this is really the posterior. This is the data convoluted with the Jacobian somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so the Jacobian wouldn't tell the whole story, I think. Mm -hmm. But the fact that it becomes more and more independent is because as my area shrinks, my reasonably allowed area, mm -hmm. um, basically 
whatever Jacobian I calculate, if I'm close enough if, if the, yeah. to a certain point, yeah. it just varies very little. Yeah, so this is somehow the statement that if the parameter, if the the model is constrained enough by the data, then it doesn't really depend on the priors, right? So this is, I don't know, a, w a way of saying that the posterior becomes independent of the prior yeah. if the, the data is strong enough. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this doesn't give a ultimate goodness of fit of the model. Yeah, but yeah. Well, that, yeah, so that's, if you're doing this uh, kind of parameter estimation, it doesn't tell you how good the fit of the, the model as a whole is. So to do that, you'll need the Bayesian evidence, which is what the next sort of part of the talk is about. But that's true, yeah. So if you do this kind of parameter estimation, you see what the good region of parameter space is, but you still don't know if the model is fitting it particularly well. Right, so Bayesian evidence. Um, so the, the Bayesian evidence is Z, or the probability of the data given a model hypothesis. And so we can also write this as an integral, since the, pos since the posterior is a probability distribution function. It has to integrate to run over the entire parameter space. So then integrating both of these sides, uh, both sides of this equation over theta, we can find an expression for the Bayesian evidence, which is this. So then this is the integral of the likelihood times the prior over the parameter space. And so this uh, essentially quantifies the goodness of fit of the model. So in, in quasi-numbers, to select between two models, we compare their posteriors. So what's the probability of model 1 over the probability of model 2? Well, you apply Bayes' theorem, and you see that it's dependent on the ratio of the Bayesian evidences times the ratio of the prior for model 1 over model 2, or model 0. So obviously, you can, you can vary these factors. You might think a priori that one kind of model is x times more likely than another kind of model because of your own personal prejudice that you worked on model A but not model B, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but I'm just going to set both of these equal to each other. So for me, gravity mediation is as likely as gauge mediation is as likely as anomaly mediation until further notice. Uh, is that okay? Oh, so L is the likelihood, so it's the probability of the data given oh, okay. these, and pi is the prior. It's very hard to do that integral. Yeah, so we've only been able to do this integral in the past year, essentially. So this integral is an integral over a, a high dimensional parameter space. Yeah, so we've had, uh, I don't know. So basically, the more parameters you allow, um, you have to calculate the likelihood for each point in this n dimensional. Uh, well, I mean, since it's a PDF, you want to ideally you'll calculate it by doing some kind of Monte Carlo integration or something like this. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't do this integral say over a whole parameter space. So you sample in the parameter space basically. Yeah. But in, in principle, basically, each theta specifies a model for which you. Well, a, a point in, in a, the parameter space of a model. Yeah. 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 So a certain set of numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then you basically have to calculate all observable data from this mm -hmm. um, for this point, and then yeah. you get the likelihood. That yeah. So like yeah. So from a Bayesian point of view, the the goodness of fit of the model depends on sort of the global structure of the parameter space, which is quite different uh, from say a frequentist chi squared, which is just you take the best fit, and that's all you care about. Yeah. So uh, the evidence is a bit strange to a lot of people because everyone's really used to chi squares. So since it's only the ratio of, of evidences that matters, you can take the, uh, and since this is a generally a very, very large number, uh, what people usually do is they take the log of the difference of the evidences rather than the ratio of the evidences. So then if you exponentiate this, this, this gives you basically odds. So if the, the difference in log of z between model A and model B is about 1, this is saying that model A is about three times more likely than model B. Uh, and similarly for two and a half and five. And so this is a empirical scale that uh, Harold Jeffries came up with. So just to, to help people have some idea of what sort of strong evidence for something was, or moderate evidence for something was in, uh, in a statistical 
light. So you can think of this as, I don't know, two sigma or three sigma or something like this. So now I've, yeah. Um, well, you can take three models, and so you have one model here as a baseline, and another one here, and another one here, and it's just the differences between them that matter. Well, this comes in. Well, this comes in the uh, in the likelihood here, right? So this is going to be a chi squared, uh, essentially a chi squared. So you're fitting some, some point in parameter space to some data, and that data has, say, a center value, and it also has a standard deviation, which incorporates experimental errors in the value of that observable and also theoretical errors in the, the calculation of that observable. Very stupid question. Why do you think this relation between the um, delta of this log z um, and its um, evidence level is empirical? Well, I mean, what's the what's the? It's empirical because strong evidence is a. Ah. Um, I mean, but yeah. <laughs> um, basically, a certain number on the left hand side corresponds exactly to a fixed probability. Uh, yeah, you can you can yeah, yeah in that sense you can do that yeah yeah it corresponds to a fixed probability but then what you decide what that probability really means for you is the uh, the subjective so part in a sense. An exact correspondent basically. This is this is quite good, and this is you know well yeah. you know <laughs> how you classify this yeah whatever yeah yeah no these three columns are in good correspondence yeah, yeah. they're not arbitrary but remark is arbitrary yeah oh. <coughs> so now I've um, hopefully semi convinced you that Bayesian evidence is good for model selection I'm going to illustrate its its use in model selection uh, with fits to different mediation mechanisms of supersymmetry breaking. So I'm, I'm aware that maybe not everyone here is some kind of a Susie junkie. So I'll just give a sort of brief two-slide introduction to supersymmetry in the MSSN. So we like Susie, uh, or phenomenologists like Susie, or maybe I like Susie, um, because it solves the hierarchy problem, and it gives us a dark matter candidate if, if our symmetry is uh, our parity if it's conserved. So but it's an experimental fact that supersymmetry is broken at low energies because we don't see these partners with the same masses. So that's fine. We know how to break symmetries. We can just sort of say, well, spontaneous breaking. There's loads of that in the standard model. But this doesn't work um, in supersymmetry because George and Demopoulos have already proved way back in the early 80s that if you break uh, supersymmetry in the visible spectra spontaneously, then there's a sum rule which says that if there's a standard model particle with, say, this mass, then there's a supersymmetric particle with mass higher than it, but also lower than it. So this means that there there should be Susie partners uh, with masses lighter than, the, than some of the squarks, which are, of course, unobserved. So this led smart theorists to come up with the concept of Susie breaking mediation. So since we can't break Susie over here, we'll break it somewhere else. And then we'll just use some kind of uh, messenger sector of interactions to tell the MSSM that Susie is, in fact, broken. So these interactions should be flavor blind blind so that we don't get all kinds of terrible flavor changing neutral currents. So what kind of mediation mechanisms can we then have? Well, these are the four that I'm going to be fitting to today. So I'm going to fit the minimal avatars of each of these uh, mechanisms to low energy data and calculate the evidence for them. So for gravity mediation, I'm taking minimal supergravity or the constrained MSSM, where SUSY breaking is by non-renormalizable terms in the supergravity Lagrangian. So this has four free parameters. Uh, the second is anomaly mediation, where supersymmetry is broken by a superconformal anomaly, or a, uh, a scaling anomaly, which has three free parameters. Then minimal gauge mediation, where you know the most obvious candidate, perhaps, for a, a flavor-blind interaction is a gauge interaction. So this is quite nice, where supersymmetry breaking is via messenger gauge multiplets that couple both to the MSSM and to the hidden sector. So that's also got. Uh, three free parameters. And finally, moduli mediation, which is sort of the, the weird cousin of gravity mediation, where it's string theoretic moduli fields that are mediating the SUSY breaking. So I'm just taking the large volume scenario that I briefly described earlier on, which has two free parameters and is therefore quite constrained. 
So a uh, brief precise of the aim. Calculate the Bayesian evidence for these four different avatars of SUSY breaking in the MSSM. So we're going to do this using a, a mechanism called multimodal nested sampling, which I'm not going to get into at all. But it was uh, a useful paper by Ferros, Hobson, and Mike Bridges, who are three Cambridge uh, cosmology folks. So this code to calculate the evidence is now public, and it's been made part of the super Bayes package. So if you fancy uh, calculating the evidences for any models in whatever field it is you work on, you should be able to do that now, which is quite nice. So coming back to the evidence, if we want to calculate the evidence, we need to specify two things, how we calculate the likelihood and how we calculate the priors, or how, how do we specify the prior. How am I for time? Half an hour. So I'll do the priors first and then talk about the likelihood. So we've said before that you know, some kind of ignorance prior is just make them flat on parameter space so that the probability of region 1 is equal to the probability of region 2 over the whole of parameter space that we scan over. So we do we calculate the evidence for linear priors. You might also argue that maybe log priors are a bit better. So if you're trying to calculate if you're trying to sample over something that's varying over many orders of magnitude, then you might think that it's fair that each order of magnitude is weighted equally rather than the largest region of parameter space being weighted the highest. Finally, there's these natural priors. So for the linear priors, we're scanning linearly over tan beta. But uh, one can also argue that one should be scanning over the B parameter of the Higgs superpotential. So so-called natural pliers, pliers, priors are simply flat in B rather than flat in tan beta. So they're related to each other by this Jacobian. So this is the Jacobian that someone was asking about earlier on. So to calculate the likelihood, um, we use direct search constraints from LEP, Tevatron, your favorite uh, collider, on the masses of the SUSY particles. Uh, also, if a point in the parameter space is tachyonic or is some, in some other way catastrophic, it gets assigned zero likelihood immediately. We don't calculate anything else. So for all the experimental observables that we take, we're applying Gaussian constraints. So that the log of the likelihood is equal to the minus the chi-squared and some uh, normalization factors. And this guy is the standard deviation. So here's your uh, experimental errors. Do you fold in at the search constraints themselves on model detection? Um, well, for the constraint, we, we've made sure sort of for A must B, because there's a dependency certainly for A must B. OK, so I guess the question is, have you applied the same search constraints to all the models? And the answer is no, we haven't. Um, yeah. Well, because the experimentalists only search in specific models. They'll write a paper saying that we have investigated the minimal supergravity model and the Guino mass has to be bigger than 300 or something like this. Um, so we don't apply Gaussian constraints to the dark matter relic density, the branching ratio of beta mu mu and the Higgs mass. So beta mu mu is very sensitive to um, light supersymmetry, but it hasn't been observed yet. There's merely an upper bound from the Tevatron. So we use this upper bound with the Tevatron likelihood <coughs> rather than a, a Gaussian constraint, a two-sided Gaussian constraint. Similarly, the Higgs mass, there's a lower bound from LEP. It hasn't been observed yet. And we use the likelihood provided by LEP for this. So if the Higgs is less than 114, it gets a strong penalty. And if it's above 114 GeV, then that's pretty much fine by us. So the dark matter is sort of the third big uh, variable that I'll be talking about today. So the relic density of dark matter has been very accurately measured by the WMAP satellite and Kobe to a lesser extent, to be about 0.11 uh, t times h squared, so up to some factors of the Hubble constant. So how do we constrain the amount, the, uh, the amount of dark matter in the universe? So in the MSSM, or the lightest SUSY particle, if our party is conserved, makes a very good dark matter candidate, because if it's neutral, it won't decay, and it just sits around the place being nice and dark. So we might think, OK, this neutralino or gravitino, it's, you know, we'll say that, that is all of the dark matter in the universe is made up of neutralino. And that's, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. In this case, you're going to apply a Gaussian constraint on the central value from WMAP5. <coughs> on the other hand, you might say, well, 
The neutralino is certainly making up some of the dark matter in the universe, but I don't necessarily believe that it's making up all of the dark matter in the universe. In this case, you, you know, the neutralino is making up some and up to all of the dark matter in the universe, but this upper bound is still good. And so that's why you might want to apply an asymmetric dark matter constraint. Finally, you might be kind of skeptical of the whole thing and just wave your arms in frustration and say, oh, but pre-Big Bang nucleosynthesis physics could screw everything up beyond all repair. I don't want to apply any dark matter constraint. And you can do that too. So we do all of these. Um, so now you've sort of persevered through that. I'll reward you with some tables and plots. So this is <coughs> the first table. I'm probably going to be quite early. Um, which shows the, the odds of the likelihood for the sign of the supersymmetric mu parameter of the Higgs superpotential. So each entry in here in this table is saying, basically, for minimal supergravity with uh, flat priors, mu greater than 0 is three times more likely than mu less than 0. Or for minimal AMSB with log priors, mu greater than 0 is 12 times more likely than mu less than 0. So there are two obvious things here. One is that all entries are posi positive. So mu greater than 0 is always more likely than mu less than 0. But the second thing is that there's a, a, you know, quite a lot of variation depending on what prior we have. So the data isn't really quite strong enough to, to get over our prior prejudices. It might be only really, really slightly more likely, or it might be moderately more likely. But is shoot. Is there a reason why the data radiation is not explicit? Um, not particularly. It's just, well, I've applied a symmetric dark matter constraint here. Oh, okay. so it's, in, it's in the paper, but it's not in this plot. Yeah. But yeah. For gauge mediation, it's essentially the same. Um, sort of moderately favored, but prior dependent. Yeah. Yeah, so that's basically what it's saying. So the most, the most constrained model is, has the sort of the, the strongest preference from mu greater than zero. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah. So coming to actual model selection, if we look at a symmetric dark matter constraint on these three uh, three guys and we normalize to the AMSB or natural prior simply because it has the lowest evidence, this is what we find. So large volume and minimal supergravity are vastly mega favored over minimal AMSB if you have a symmetric dark matter constraint by thousands or tens of tens of thousands of times. So why is this? This is basically because in AMSB, the lightest uh, particle is quite naturally neutralino, but it's a Wino-like neutralino. So it comes with a, a chargino partner that's only very slightly uh, heavier than it. So this leads to a very, very efficient co-annihilation through the entire parameter space, which means that the dark matter relic density all over parameter space is essentially zero. In fact, it's, it's far, far below the WMAP constraint. So the reason that minimal AMSB is strongly disfavored here is because it has essentially no relic density, no neutralino relic density. So you shouldn't look upon this as saying minimal supergravity is hugely favored. It's a great model. You should look at this as saying, well, M MAMSB fits the dark matter really, really badly. Well, yeah, this is the same prior dependence I was talking about before, yeah. Mm. It doesn't mean you can throw it out the window. I mean, it's still always a large factor more greater, right? Yeah, the next one could be minus 13. I mean, I mean, it could be uh, 1 over 13. It could, yeah, well, it could be, but it, it hasn't been for any of the priors that we've looked at, I guess. This is true. I mean, but at, at one stage, at, at some stage, you have to sort of say, well, there's prior dependence, but it still seems to be favoring this scenario to some extent or the other. So since AMSB is really disfavored because it's fitting the, uh, the dark matter relic density so badly, maybe it does better with an asymmetric dark matter constraint. So if we put in an asymmetric dark matter constraint, then things sort of flip around. So the relic density in MAMSB is essentially 0. So with an asymmetric dark matter constraint, the dark matter constraint doesn't doesn't hit the parameter space at all, essentially. So 
if you think about the, neutral, the parameter space of AMSB, you apply an asymmetric dark matter constraint, you still have the same parameter space, basically. But for minimal supergravity in large volume, the amount of parameter space that satisfies the, uh, the relic density that we require is actually very small. So it's actually much more natural in M sugar and large volume <coughs> to have quite a large neutral linear relic density, much larger than that uh, measured by W map. So this kills an awful lot of parameter space. Uh, and it's basically this which is enforcing MAs be seeming to be now better fitting. You're not happy, Frank. Oh, really? Well, the, the neutralino, yeah. What's the symmetric dark matter? Sure. And to find M sucra does really, really good. Now you say, well, maybe well I don't know about really, really good, but... Significantly, fantastically much better than M A M S. Well, it does much better than M A S B. This isn't necessarily really, really good. Okay. <laughs> I think the point here is that you are looking at ratios. Probably the overall probability to have a model in the asymmetric that al is allowed by the asymmetric constraint is much, much bigger than the one if you apply the symmetric constraint. Frank's so still not happy. Keep going, Frank. Um, I would have thought that the numbers that you have there are measured for the allowed volume. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm surprised that the volume shrinks if you open up phase space. No, How is the volume shrinking? The How is the volume? How is the volume shrinking here? Uh, so so this is normalized to something different, right? You said it's normalized to that. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so this upper plot is normalized to here, and this one is normalized to something different. Yeah. Since it's only the differences that matter, right? So, so th there's no absolute scale that's, that's valid for both of these plots. Is that? Is that okay? Or yeah. I, I, I think I was good by this. It's normalized to that size. Ah, it's just normalized to the smallest number. But, okay. but the simple question, is there something like an absolute number, an absolute volume that you can use? No. You get a bunch of models, and you compare them to each other, and you say, this model is the best, um, and these ones are, are kind of rubbish. We treat them all equally. So if you're comparing to a distribution with 20 points in the diagram stuff, each one of those points. What do you mean a distribution? When you're fitting a distribution, you have, do you count each bin in that histogram of the distribution with the same weight as you count the one number that you get from the dark matter? I'm still not sure I understand. OK. So coming back to this prior dependence, this is the AMSB parameter space with uh, priors that are linear in time beta. So and the green sort of splodge is the, uh, the best fit point. So there's no major surprises here. Sort of light SUSY is favored. Fine. This is ruled out by uh, direct searches in Gaginos. And over here, you have some tachyonic sleptons. So then if you apply the natural priors in uh, flat in B, you get some sort of quite different looking things. You're still getting this region down here, which was good fit. But then you're saying that the posterior is actually uh, really being favored up here. So this is a bit strange. So mostly what this, this is due to is um, a region of small time beta at large M0. So partly it's the, f the f the Jacobian I showed you earlier on has a factor essentially 1 over tan beta. So smaller tan beta is sort of preferred by the natural priors. That's one thing that leads it up to here. The other thing is that it's a lot of it is a volume effect. Um, since, since there's just an awful lot more parameter space up here than there is in this small region, basically. So 
I've just been arguing that the fits have been really dominated by the dark matter, so let's take it out altogether and see what we get. So without having any dark matter constraint whatsoever, so just the low energy constraints like g minus 2 and beta s gamma, this is what we see normalized to this uh, mg miss b with natural priors, just because it's the smallest one. And w basically, there's, there's no huge difference between any of these models then. They're all essentially about the same, and there's still a bit of uh, prior dependence in there. So our fits are completely dominated by dark matter, basically. Um, as per, yeah. In MG must be you have a factor of four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And similar with A must be, yeah. So the yeah, the, the the parameter spaces aren't constrained enough by the indirect data to uh, to distinguish between the models yet. Yeah, that's the main thing to take from this table. I guess we were hoping for something else, but you know. But basically, that just means there is not enough data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's data enough there, but well, there is plenty of data in some sense, but it's not constraining enough. There's only so much you can. There's only so far you can go with using, say, g minus 2 con to constrain a whole SUSY model, basically, rather than saying the LHC has measured this particular kinematic mm -hmm. edge measurement, which would then kill a whole load of parameter space. So basically, to, to really get rid of a lot of this um, prior dependence, you would actually need observe a higher dimensional parameter space, and you would need roughly one observable for each direction to really pin it down to a point and not just a line. Maybe, yeah, yeah. So to see, uh, these next two plots will sort of show you how much of an effect the, uh, the WMAP data is having. So this is the minimal or binned minimal supergravity space with the m half uh, genome masses and m naught scalar masses on each axis. And sort of the red regions are the good fit, and blue means bad fit. So there's, there's no huge constraints on here, basically. This is ruled out by direct searches, and this has Stau LSP. So the dark matter wouldn't be dark if it was charged. Um, so then with a symmetric W map constraint, you kill nearly all of that parameter space. And you get regions essentially here, here, and here. So down here, we have some Stau co-annihilation. Um, here, there's annihilation because of a, an S-channel resonance. So two neutralinos can annihilate, or can not annihilate. You know what an S-channel resonance looks like. I, can't I don't really know how to describe that. Two neutralinos come in, and then they turn into a, an A Higgs boson, basically. And then that decays into some standard model stuff. And that brings the neutralino reddick density down. And up here is a focus point region where the neutralino is higgsino like and so can annihilate quite efficiently. So it's really no surprise that looking, looking at this is essentially one observable doing this, um, that our fits are completely dominated by that one observable. Um, so I'm just going to talk briefly now about the effects of beta s gamma and g minus 2, since aside from the WMAP data, they're sort of the, the strongest data we have and most interesting. So uh, the Muin has an anomalous magnetic moment, and there's a discrepancy between the standard model prediction and experiment, which is this guy, delta A nu. So this is about a 3.2, 3.3 sigma discrepancy. Now, supersymmetry can contribute to the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon. And the si uh, dominated by these two diagrams, although there have been many, many papers calculating other two-loop diagrams, et cetera, et cetera. But the main thing to take out of this is that these two diagrams, we want them to be positive, and that they're proportional to sine mu m1 mu m and sine mu m2. Similarly, there can also be large SUSY contributions to the branching ratio of beta s gamma. So there's not, su there's not really that much of a discrepancy, or the discrepancy at least oscillates between when different people release different papers. <coughs> but there are similar diagrams um, from top charge TIGs and stop charge geno loops. So if we want these to be not contributing an awful lot, since there's no real discrepancy, we want these to interfere a bit which requires sine mu times the top Yukawa greater than zero. So in 
minimal GMSB, minimal supergravity, and large volume. The gay genome masses are all positive. So since g minus 2 prefers sine mu times the gay genome masses to be positive, g minus 2, or delta mu, prefers mu greater than 0 in these three scenarios, which is probably the single biggest pull towards mu the preference for mu greater than 0. On the other hand, in these models, the top Yukawa, when you run down, is usually less than 0. So a sine of mu times at has the wrong sign, essentially. And so the branching error from beta as gamma is usually badly fitted. So you're sort of going in the wrong direction. So there's a certain tension between predictions for beta as gamma and delta mu, which has been explored quite nicely in a paper of Farhan Feroz and collaborators. So basically, if you're going in the right direction to, to solve the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon problem, then you're kind of then the you'll be going the wrong direction to fit beta as gamma. So what's quite cute is that a AMSB doesn't have these problems. So in AMSB, the gay genome masses depend on the beta functions. So M1 and M2 are positive, but M3 is negative, and AT is also positive. So it's fine for gay genome masses to be negative, since they're uh, complex fermions, and we can always just rotate them to be positive. <coughs> so in particular, this means that AMSB can uh, fit both delta A mu and sort of beta S gamma, or at least it can. Well, I should explain this plot before I start blathering. So the experimental point favored for delta mu and beta S gamma is here in the middle of this ellipse. And this ellipse is a 68% confidence ellipse, basically. And this is the, the binned parameter space of AMSB into the delta mu beta S gamma plane. So all this parameter space on the right here, this is from mu greater than 0. And this is from mu less than 0. So this is just showing you, obviously, in sort of visually, how much more mu greater than 0 is favored than mu less than 0. So the thing to see here is that although it's not fitting it that awesomely, it's at least getting into roughly the right region. But if I show you the same plot for GMSB, then GMSB is missing this ellipse by, uh, by some amount. And that really, starting from this 0 point here, you want to be you want to have a positive correlation between them rather than a negative correlation between them. Um, and that's all I have to say really on beta gamma and g minus 2. Uh, I just think they're quite cute. So that's essentially the end of my talk now. So I've talked to you a bit about parameter estimation, uh, Bayesian parameter estimation, and Bayesian model selection, and sort of illustrated this with examples taken from uh, model selection of supersymmetry breaking mechanisms in the MSSM. So what we found uh, when we did these fits is that although there is a preference of mu greater than 0, it's moderate at best. So if you do do any fits, maybe you should consider mu less than 0 as well. We also found that our, our, our fits were completely dominated by the dark matter constraint that we applied. So that if we had a symmetric dark matter, large volume was a bit favored. With asymmetric dark matter, AMSB was a bit favored. But if we had no dark matter constraint, our fits were inconclusive. So take from this what you will. Um, but thank you for, for giving me your time for the past 50 minutes. So thanks for this insight into Bayesian statistics and how to apply to uh, constrained models. Are there any more questions? It's fine, but... There's not much you can do here without the dark matter. Yeah. Yeah. But in principle, it will in I suppose in principle, if you could calculate the gravitino relic density, you could you could constrain something. Yeah. And so one of the things I noticed is when you do the uh, MSB group, they have a huge parameter space, and then you apply the dark matter and you straight together. Yeah. Well, you can. S well, not necessarily, right? So in GMSB, you can you have you can still have omega h squared far too big. You can have this gravitino problem. Dimensions uh, 
Okay, good. So, so I think what I'm after is if you, if you compare, if, if you take this ratio and, and you have one dimensional parameter space and a five hundred dimensional parameter space, yeah. it's, it's very hard to, to believe that there's any chance for the one dimensional parameter space to win. Well, I think you have to just choose the same parameter space. I mean, you don't compare multiple space like that. Not necessarily, no. But I mean, I've been doing it for GMSB and MSuber oh, and stuff. Oh, oh. So in, in principle, Four versus two or three versus two. Yeah. So in, in principle, Frank, the answer to this is so this is integral of likelihood times um, the prior. So in principle, the prior is a, is, a, is a PDF, a probability distribution function. And so it has to integrate to one over the parameter space. So then if I have, say I have this and I integrate it over some uh, model with a parameter space of dimension n and get some number z, OK, good. Now say uh, I augment my model and add in an extra uh, parameter. So now I have an extra dimension in my thing. So this is now dn plus 1. But because this still has to integrate to 1, the prior drops over the entire parameter space. So unless this drop in the prior is compensated by a corresponding increase in the goodness of fit in the likelihood, then the overall uh, evidence will also drop. So it's... Yeah. So this is, I don't know, it's some kind of... Uh, Occam's razor effect, basically. If you if you put in extra dimensions, unless you have much better fit because of those extra dimensions, then the overall goodness of fit will go down. How, okay, obviously, maybe this is a huge question, but how would this change the data phase of super sets in our HP? I mean, how quickly would this really zoom in on one thing? Um, so there's, there's been uh, one or two studies. So I think Lester at Al and maybe Roskowski at Al. So they've ba they've basically what they've said is, say, at the SPS 1A point, with, uh, there's a certain amount of, uh, you know, you g generate 10 inverse femtobarns at SPS 1A or something like this. Then you can see these kinematic edge measurements to this accuracy, basically. And then use that as the data. And they've done this. And you can, you, can, you can zoom in quite well. I mean, very, very well. So in a constrained model like this, it's pretty good. Because you essentially only have one parameter controlling all of the scalar masses, and all in like m sugar, I mean, and one parameter controlling all of the gauge genome masses. So you don't need many direct measurements to really nail down where in parameter space you are. So for a, a model with this number of dimensions that we're talking here, 3, 4, 5, um, then you, could, you should be able to sort of really zoom in quite early. But if you're talking about something like a 20-dimensional Feno MSSM or the full MSSM, then it'll, I imagine you'll some, some parameters will be well constrained, and some parameters will still be essentially free. Okay, but these are, yeah, in principle that's true, but the direct searches are in some sense subleading. They're not the most important thing uh, in constraining these models. I, I think they also have a different quality. In if quality in what sense? Well, um, if you do indirect constraint, right, um, this is about picking a number. Mm -hmm. And then you can ask yourself how well did I pick the number? Mm -hmm. I believe the exclusion boundary without any error yeah. coming with it. Then there's no fitting error. Yeah. You, you, you just happen you to just have... You just snip, snip, snip. Yeah. Exactly. It's just off. Yeah. This is true. So I think there's another group, which is Tillman Plain's group, who have been doing similar things. The Fitino or Sfitino people, or Sfitter. I forget what their name is. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope you're not a member of this collaboration. Um, 
Um, well, I do hope you remember this collaboration, because um, that's great, but I hope I haven't insulted you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so they have been considering these direct search constraints, and they've been applying sort of earth. So instead of just a, a chop, they've been applying some kind of uh, error function on it, basically. So it just goes up very, very quickly. So then they could do something like that. Which, which is kind of what, yeah, which is like what you do with the Higgs, I guess. Um, you know, the, the Higgs can be a little less than 114. That's OK. But not much more. Again, but also l to let me announce that we are going to dinner tonight, um, maybe around 7 15 or so. Um, we haven't yet fully decided where to go, but we'll probably meet. Suggestions um, welcome. Yeah.